Welcome, happy Sabbath. It's wonderful to have so many people here. Thank you for coming, and it's just a blessing for me to see Mike and Sherry and their visitors, and Lily, who's not in the room, I don't think. And it's Maureen, it's great to have you here, and everybody else as well. Um, let's just have a prayer before we start. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together as one of one accord in this place. Lord, we little know how long we'll have to do this. I know that already persecution is coming on our brethren in other parts of the earth to be able to gather in buildings such as this. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit would be amongst us, that you would pour out your Spirit upon us in latter rain power, that we might receive the seal of the living God. Father, our hearts tremble as we recognize our undone condition before you. We ask that you would forgive us for all the times we failed to study and apply ourselves. And we pray now that you would redeem the time, that you would quicken our minds and help us to understand these things, that we might settle into them so we cannot be moved. We thank you now for your Holy Spirit being our teacher and our guide, and we, we invite his presence once again with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to be presenting a lot of information this morning, and I recognize there's people here who may not have heard some of these things before, so I wanted to recommend a couple of things. We have a website out there which has got current um, videos upon it about on this line. It's called www.themidnightcry.co.uk and also um, Thomas is filming the sermons that go on here and they're on a YouTube channel called Future for Adventism. I just wanted to make you aware of that so that you can study in your own time and catch up on some of the information. And I'd like to start the sermon by reading a scripture reading from Daniel 9, 24 and 25. Daniel 9, 24 and 25. This is a familiar passage for most of us Adventists. We know that this is the start in prophecy of the 70 weeks, which we know is part of the 2300 days. So this is the beginning of the 2300 days. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. We'll come back to the scripture reading in just a moment. I'd like to read an Ellen White quote from Education, page 15.2 and 16.1. To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. Love, the basis of creation and redemption, is the basis of true education. To love him, the infinite, the omniscient one, with the whole strength and mind and heart, means the highest development of every power. It means that in the whole being, the body, the mind, as well as the soul, the image of God is to be restored. So I want to put that down over here. Restoration. And there's a significant amount of light coming out of the word rest. But restoration is the principle behind the work of God. Man separated himself from God at the beginning. Sin came in and we separated. We no longer had face-to-face -face communion with him and we lost the image of God in our characters. So now the purpose of God is the purpose of restoration. To restore in us the character of Christ that we might fully reflect him and once more be in harmony with him so we can live with him in the physical flesh. That's the purpose of the everlasting gospel. Amen. So restoration, a work of cleansing has to go on in the work of restoration. 
and a gathering of a people. So he has to pull a people out of the world to himself that they might be purified and then pull as many people as he can with them. And that's been his object through the history of the Bible. So let's just have a look at this. That's the everlasting gospel restoration. And the everlasting gospel is drawn on the board here for you in covenant lines or reform lines. This is what we're doing here on the board to show you the work of the everlasting gospel in every generation and how God works to do that. So let's put a definition of the everlasting gospel up here. People would probably know, some people know this by heart. The everlasting gospel, and I just want to put this in the record, is the work of Christ in producing and then demonstrating a righteous people in his people through a three-step prophetic testing message and that's how he works in every generation and we can see that here on the board in these lines of history prophetic history so God has this problem he has a people that, that are estranged from him and he now has a work to do on them to bring them to a position where they can be convicted of sin or come to a place of reformation, they need to be reformed, and then they need to be producing righteousness, have revival in their lives, for this, for this process of reformation and revival, and then a judgment takes place, where the two groups of people are separated, and the two groups of people are always seen in this history, so here they have a choice whether they're going to listen to this conviction of sin, and then decide to manifest righteousness or to fall away from God. And that's where the second angel's message is, Babylon is fallen. And this is the three angel's messages. The first one is fearing God, this conviction of sin. Babylon is fallen. You're either going to perfect a righteous character and manifest Christ, or you're going to fall and follow Satan. And then judgment comes and a door is shut here and the two classes are finally separated and God calls his people out for himself. I want you to notice in these lines, this is the beginning of ancient Israel, so this is the line of Moses. Then we have the end of ancient Israel, which is the line of Christ. Then we have the beginning of modern Israel, which is the Millerites. And then we have the end of modern Israel, which is 144,000, or the time period in which we're living. In each of these histories, the purpose of God was to restore a people to himself, to have a knowledge of him and his character, who he is, his glory. If we look at the timeline of Moses, the purpose of the three-step testing process was to bring them to the fourth point. And the fourth point was the giving of the law on Sinai. And this is Pentecost in the history of Moses. So when that law was given, God's glory was manifest. They had to understand the law in order to be able to reflect God's character, to fully keep the law. So he reveals the law to them here. At the time of Christ, they had to go through this three-step testing process to get to number four, which was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And what day was that? Pentecost. So in this history, you see a 50, because Pentecost was 50 days for the resurrection of Christ. So here we have the Holy Spirit being poured out. So now we have the Holy Spirit. Another, definite, another way of describing the work of the Holy Spirit is the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So prophecy, the law and the prophets have to be established to, to, for the gospel to take place. The law and the gospel is another way of saying it. So here we see an emphasis on the law. Here we see an emphasis on Holy Spirit or the spirit of prophecy. So we could put prophecy, prophets. 
And another way of looking at it is to say that God needs a sanctuary or a temple or a place where people can understand the law and worship him and he needs a people. So he needs a sanctuary and he needs a host. So we've got this idea of having the law connected to a sanctuary and we've got this idea of having a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and that's a host. And this language of sanctuary and host is picked up in Daniel 8. And that's the fundamental basis of Adventism. The question in Daniel 8 is how long is this trampling of God's sanctuary and his host going to take place? And we're told the answer is under 2,300 days. And that's what we're going to look at now. Because that work involves a cleansing. So it involves the cleansing of a sanctuary and a host. The cleansing of the place of worship or where the law is and the host, the people. So there's this corresponding work of cleansing goes on to restore them. And that's what we're seeing here. So we see an emphasis on Lord and the Holy Spirit here. And this is at 50. There's an association with 50. In the Millerite history, the fundamental, the foundation of the Millerite history was the 1843 charm. And this was a prophetic message that God raised up for his people. And it was printed on these charts. You see them here before us. And the 1843 chart was the thing the Millerite preachers used to bring them to October 22nd, 1844. And the whole purpose of their three-step testing process was to bring them to point four, which was in 1850, and it's no coincidence that it's 50, 1850, the 1850 chart was written, on which they had all the prophetic rights, so they had prophecy, And now they have the Sabbath and the sanctuary restored because they have light after, after the disappointment. They recognize they didn't understand the sanctuary, that it was in heaven and not on earth. And they now understood that they had to keep all ten of the commandments. So we have the Sabbath and the law here. So we can see here that we have the law and we have prophecy. Of the Holy, this is the work of the Holy Spirit in both histories. And here we have the Holy Spirit, prophecy, the host, and the law here. Sanctuary. Here we have a people who are now called out to start the church, that's SDA church. So we have an SDA people, and, we, and they have a message. They understand prophecy and the sanctuary and the Sabbath. So you can see how it's all coming together in this life. In our history, we're going to go through a three-step testing process, which brings us to the close of human probation. When that happens, he's seeking to bring us to point four. In our history... This is the second coming of Christ. And he needs a purified people to come through to that point so they can be translated or resurrected to go to heaven with him. And that's the crux here of this. And in the process of that, they're going to be fully manifesting the Holy Spirit because they're fully reflecting Christ, so they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're keeping the law of God. So here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is the people of Revelation 12 that God's going to have at the end. Everything's going to be restored at this point. And they're going to be ready for the second coming of Christ. And I think Julia this afternoon is going to talk about the Jubilee year. And the Jubilee year, the significance of it is a restoration, is a time of... Um, gathering of the people, it was a blessing on the people, and it was marked every 50 years. This is the jubilee. It's a time of celebration of the work of God and how good he is. And I think he's going to show that the second coming happens in the jubilee. So, this is, you can see how there's 50 in every history. We can see the law, we can see the prophets, and we can see that the reason God has to get them to that place is to restore in them the glory or the character of God. And the way he chooses to do that is to bring them through a testing process that brings them to the place where they can bear to be in the presence of God. We see that here. God himself came down on Mount Sinai to give the law. Christ himself was there, we're told. Here, we have a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Godhead, the third power of the Godhead. So the Godhead is manifest in these histories. And here we're told that these charts are as the rock of ages. So this is the rock of ages to God's people and they're to stand on them 
and that this was a glorious manifestation of the power of God in his history was seen. So it's to bring us, we're to reflect his character, to bring us back into the presence of God. So let's go back to our scripture reading. I'm going to rub some of this out now. Let's see. What are we rubbing? I want to keep one line at the top just to give us an idea. So hopefully you can see from some of that that history repeats. And we're told that the Millerite history will repeat to the letter in our time. And that the parable of the ten virgins is that history. And we're to understand how God has worked in the reformations of the past and the lines of the past. And that that history repeating is our test today to recognise where we are on our line and what we're to do about it. So it was for, it's for us to recognise the light that's shining and how we're to conform our lives to that light to be ready for the end goal, the second coming of Christ. And God illustrates the end from the beginning. So in this repeat of history, in every history, he's illustrating the end of the world to us. We know that each of the ancient prophets spoke more for our day than they did for their own. So all these histories are testifying to our day, to tell us something about our time. And a reference for God illustrating the end from the beginning is Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. I'm not going to give all these references because some, some of this we've gone over before. But it says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So let's look at the end from the beginning. We're told to repeat the Millerite history. In the Millerite history, we have the three angels' messages arriving. And it brought them to a closed door in 1844. And they went through this three-step testing process. The door was shut here. And this marked, this closed here, was October 22nd, 1844. And the Millerites recognised this was the end of the 2,300 days. So let's go back to the beginning, the 2,300 days. And what do we see? We see a three-step process to begin the 2,300 days. And this is the third decree. So there were three decrees at this time period, the beginning of the 2,300 days. And if the beginning illustrates the end, we see there was a three decree, not the third decree, it marks the beginning of the 2,300 days, which was 457 BC, and was given by Artaxerxes, 457 BC, and this brought the Millerites to this date, October 22nd, 1844, the end of the 2300 days. So we can see that at the beginning they had a three-step process, and at the end they have a three-step process. So I just wanted to put that there to see the significance of understanding what's going on in this history, because we're going to repeat this one, and if this one illustrates this one, then we need to understand what's going on in this one as well. And this is significant in regards to the light that's coming out now about decrees and lawmaking. So let's go to this history. We're going to look at this time period and understand a bit more about it. So this is the timeline of the three decrees. Years. 
because of their disobedience to God and their breaking of the covenant. So God is always seeking to bring us back into covenant relationship with him. And that's what the law and the prophets is all about, the everlasting covenant or the everlasting gospel. So let's read a quote from Prophets and Kings, page 714, and this is about darkness. Today the church of God is free to carry forward to completion the divine plan for the salvation of a lost race. For many centuries, God's people suffered a restriction of their liberties. And that was the 1260 year period she's talking about there. The preaching of the gospel in its purity was prohibited, and the severest of penalties were visited upon those who dared disobey the mandates of men. As a consequence, the Lord's great moral vineyard was almost wholly unoccupied. The people were deprived of the light of God's word. The darkness of error and superstition threatened to blot out a knowledge of true religion. God's church on earth was as verily in captivity during this long period of relentless persecution as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon during the period of their exile. Is that 714? 714, 714. Prophets and Kings. PK, Prophets and Kings, 714. So we can see from that that Ellen White is drawing a parallel from the 1260 years of darkness which is where the Millerite time at the end comes, 1798, to the darkness of 70 years of captivity of the children of Israel in Babylon. So this time of the end is coming, the end of the 70 years is coming, and Daniel is searching the scriptures. So let's look at Daniel 9, the beginning of Daniel 9, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So here's Daniel studying the prophet of Jeremiah, the prophecies of Jeremiah. He recognizes that their punishment was only to last 70 years. Now, Daniel was taken into captivity when he was 17 years old. He's already been in captivity almost 70 years, so he's about 86, 87 at this point. He's in the first year of Darius. When Babylon was taken over by Medo-Persia, Darius was the first king to reign. Cyrus helped him bring down Babylon, but Darius reigned for two years, and then Cyrus came onto the throne. And that was 538 approximately BC when Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. So this is the first year of Darius, so this is around 538 BC, when Daniel is studying these things and he recognises the 70 years is about to come to fruition. It's the same in the time of the end of Moses, it's the birth of Moses, when people are recognising a deliverer is about to come. So they recognise they're about to be delivered out of Babylon here. So Daniel has these prophecies. Still burdened in behalf, this is from Prophets and Kings 554.2. Still burdened in behalf of Israel, Daniel studied and knew the prophecies of Jeremiah. They were very plain, so plain that he understood by these testimonies recorded in books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, and he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So he's studying prophecy. So Daniel's here, and he's studying prophecy. And then we see that also there's an increase of knowledge. In every history there's an increase of knowledge where God raises up people to recognise that this prophetic light is about to come. Many like Daniel, this is Prophets and Kings 558.3. Many like Daniel had been studying the prophecies and had been seeking God for his promised intervention in behalf of Zion. And now their prayers were being answered. And this is talking about the first decree that's about to be passed. Their prayers are being answered. Heaven was bending low to hear the earnest supplication of the prophet. This is from Prophets and Kings 556.3. Heaven was bending low to hear the earnest supplication of the prophet. Even before he had finished his plea for pardon and restoration, the mighty Gabriel again appeared to him and called his attention to the vision he had seen prior to the fall of Babylon and the death of Belshazzar. And then the angel outlined before him in detail the period of the 70 weeks which was to begin at the time of the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. So now, Daniel's in earnest prayer in the whole chapter 9. He's confessing the sins of his people. He's recognizing his need. He's studying prophecy. And this is, should be our experience at this time. So we recognize where we are and what our time of the end is. He's searching his soul. And Gabriel is sent to answer him. If we look at verse 21, 
It says, Yea, whilst, Daniel 9, 21, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to, to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. And this is what God wants to do for us. He wants to give us skill and understanding. Amen. And this is what he did for them, Daniel, and it's what he did for the Millerites in understanding the start date of the 2,300 days. Daniel wanted to understand it because he wanted to know when he was going to be restored. But it's not quite the answer to his question that he's looking for. At the beginning of the supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. And now he's told about the 70-week prophecy. So he gets light on prophecy and what's about to happen, and it's connected to the restoration of his people, because it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, and in verse 25, we get, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So he's told here that there's going to be a commandment to restore Jerusalem, and that from that point, there's going to be 70 weeks till Messiah comes. So this is an answer to his prayer, but it's giving him a lot more light than he asked for. And then we see a formalization of the message here. I'm going to put this down. And I'm going to put these on here. This is the first, second, and third decree. We'll come to that in a minute. So there's these three decrees are given by the Persian kings to help Israel. So as Daniel's studying this, he's wondering. What decree is, when is going to, somebody going to give this decree? It must be soon, because it's 70 years, it's coming to an end. He doesn't know probably exactly when it is, but he knows that, that soon this decree is going to be given when they can go back and restore Jerusalem. And this is taken from Prophets and Kings 557.2. The deliverance of Daniel from the den of lions had been used of God to create a favourable impression upon the mind of Cyrus the Great. So... Darius has been reigning for two years. Daniel goes into the lion's den. We know that story very well in Daniel 6. He's had this experience in the lion's den. Cyrus has heard about it. Now Darius, for some reason, steps off the throne. I don't know if he dies or he comes down. Steps down. But Cyrus takes over and he's already heard of Daniel in the lion's den. He's already got a favorable impression of Daniel, so he knows Daniel. The sterling qualities of the man of God as a statesman of far-seeing ability led the Persian ruler to show him marked respect and to honor his judgment. And now, just at the time God had said he would cause his temple at Jerusalem to be rebuilt, he moved upon Cyrus as his agent to discern the prophecies concerning himself, with which Daniel was so familiar, and to grant the Jewish people their liberty. As the king saw the words foretelling more than a hundred years before his birth, the manner in which Babylon should be taken, as he read the message addressed to him by the ruler of the universe, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. As he saw before his eyes the declaration of the eternal God, for Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. As he traced the inspired record, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward. His heart was profoundly moved. So I don't know if people know this, but there was a prophecy in Isaiah 45 about Cyrus, which was written about 100 years before by the prophet Isaiah, that Cyrus would be the one to deliver God's people and let them go back to the land. And so Daniel knew this prophecy and is named in that prophecy over 100 years before. We think 100 years in the scheme of things isn't that long, but if somebody um, 100 years ago, around the beginning of the 1900s, gave a prophecy about you, I think we'd be quite impressed by that. And so now... Daniel comes and shows him Isaiah 45, and the heart of Cyrus is moved. So Cyrus now begins to understand the work that he's got to do, the message that he's got to give to God's people. And it's the same as when the burning bush, when God comes to Moses and says, take off your shoes, this is what I want you to do, I want you to go and deliver Israel. So he gets this message from God directly that this is the work he's going to do. Emma, so what's that mark that you put there? Uh, that's just that's the message being formalised. That's the formalisation of the message. So um, I'm just assuming people are familiar with the lines, and I know we're not. So I'm trying to do it fairly simply. But um, there's a there's a message. This is where the person is is convicted by God of the message that they're going to do, and the message gets established. This is what you've got to do. So in the history of Moses, it's the burning bush when God says, "You're to go to Egypt now and deliver my people." So this comes to Cyrus. It's a prophetic message. 
and he understands what his work is and what he's to do now. So he's moved upon by God to do this work, 